Good morning. The scripture this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. May God bless the reading of these words. Well, good morning. And Charlie, thank you so much for reading those inspiring words today and it's so good to have you back and Marcy as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Would you please join with me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God of Spirit, God of love. During my college years, I didn't consider myself to be religious, and I didn't know much about the Bible. However, I did sing in a church choir, and I enjoyed great choral music. Every Christmas, my church choir sang the Messiah, complete with professional soloist and orchestra and I grew to love the Messiah. After the orchestra played the overture, the tenor soloist stood up and sang these words, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. And after the tenor solo was done, we the choir stood up and with exalted voices we sang, every valley shall be exalted. I didn't know at the time that these words were from the Bible, let alone that they are from the book of Isaiah. I only knew that the music and the message were both joyous, and the Messiah came, became synonymous to me with Advent. Fast forward more than 50 years. I still love the Messiah. And I still think of Advent whenever I hear those words, comfort ye, or, and every valley. However, I now know that these words are from the Bible. And they are from, specifically, the passage that Charlie just read, Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 5. And I also know that these words have come to signify, to mean much more to me, than simply that they come, uh, they associate themselves with Advent. The scripture comes from that section of the book of Isaiah known as Second Isaiah, chapters 40 through 66. In these chapters, the prophet consoles the people of Judah who have been in exile in Babylon with the promise of a joyous return to their homeland. In verses 1 and 2, the prophet tells of God's assurance to the people of Israel that their term in exile in payment for their sins is over, that their penalty has been paid. Verse 3 is a call to action. Those in the wilderness are to prepare the way of the Lord by building in the desert a highway for our God. 
And verses 4 and 5 build upon this vision that the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. My focus in this sermon will be on verse 3. A voice cries out, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Let's unpack this, this verse. First, who is the voice that's speaking? According to the HarperCollins Study Bible, the voice in Isaiah 43 is that of a member of God's royal consul, that is to say, an angel who is speaking on behalf of God. This voice is not in the wilderness, but is speaking of the wilderness. Next, what is the wilderness? The wilderness is a recurrent theme in the Bible, from the Israelites wandering in the wilderness after the Exodus to Jesus' time in the wilderness before he began his ministry. The wilderness is a place of danger and of deprivation. In the time of Isaiah, the people of Judah were in the wilderness held captive in Babylon. Centuries later, in the time of the Gospel writers, Israel was once again in the wilderness, subject to the oppressive rule of Rome. Now, what does it mean to make straight in the desert a highway for our God? This refers to the practice at that time of preparing a road for a royal procession. For Isaiah, that highway in the desert will take the people of Judah home. As I have reflected upon this Isaiah passage, I realize how applicable it is to our time. I believe that the words of Isaiah help us or call us to help those who have been cast into society's wilderness, rejected because of who they are. I know this on a personal basis because my parents and my grandparents spent time in the wilderness. My mother and her family were thrust into the wilderness in 1942 when they were ordered by our government to leave their home in California and they were imprisoned along with 114,000 other Americans of Japanese ancestry because of their race. They were considered to be the enemy, despite no evidence supporting this claim. Once in the wilderness, many Japanese Americans remained there for many years. Even though the government's relocation program ended in 1944, many of those who had been imprisoned were reluctant to return to their West Coast homes, where prejudice still ran high inflamed by wartime rhetoric and racism. My mother's family did not return to their pre-war home in Pomona, California, a suburb of Los Angeles. Instead, they decided to uh, leave Heart Mountain Relocation Center in northern Wyoming and try farming in Iowa. And it was there that I was born in 1946. The weather soon proved too severe for them and they returned to California and my grandfather's family began uh, resumed farming on a small scale. And over the years, their time in the wilderness gradually ended. But while I can say that the Japanese American community by and large no longer dwells in the wilderness, many people in this country still do. In our church, we acknowledge the reality of this fact every Sunday when our liturgist recites these words. We stand with all who have been marginalized because of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual identity, religious beliefs, socioeconomic status and any other ways in which God has made us diverse 
and unique. Now, I feel that we can all align behind these words, but what do they mean? What does it mean to stand with those who have been marginalized? A few weeks ago, Michelle Luna delivered a powerful sermon where she reminded us that prayers alone are not enough. They must be accompanied by action in order to be effective. I believe that as a church, we are called to go into the wilderness to prepare God's way. For an example of what this looks like, I'd like to return to the experience of the Japanese American community during World War II and its aftermath. I recently read an article by a scholar named Jeffrey Copeland who has studied this period. He concludes that select groups of churches in California and elsewhere in this country were among the only supporters of the Japanese American community during their internment, a time when racial prejudice stoked by wartime propaganda was at a fever pitch. Churches demonstrated their support in many ways, from storing and safeguarding the possessions of Japanese Americans while they were incarcerated, to providing hostels and transition housing after they returned to their pre-war homes. Copeland concludes that these churches demonstrated Christian charity by providing a measure of humanity to an otherwise inhumane situation. Their efforts provided timely, tangible, and empathetic support that had a lasting effect on Japanese Americans to help them rebuild their communities, their finances, and their lives. As I read about the history of churches that reached out to help the Japanese American community during World War II, it brought to mind the work done by many members of this congregation over the past several years in support of immigrants detained at the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma through organizations such as Aid Northwest, which provides compassionate support and immigration services for those seeking asylum. Certainly this work is done in the spirit of going into the wilderness to prepare God's way for those who are lost. We should also remember our role as an open and affirming church to support the LGBTQ plus community, which is still very much in the wilderness. This summer, I was reminded of the reality faced by those who identify with the LGBTQ plus community, when at the invitation of Justice McCartney, Rosemary and I joined several other members of this congregation at a meeting of the Gig Harbor City Council to consider an ordinance that would authorize the pride flag to fly alongside the United States flag in front of City Hall every June. The council chambers were packed and chairs had to be set up in the entry for it to accommodate the overflow. When the time for public comments began, it soon became apparent that the majority of people there opposed the ordinance. A common theme of those opposed was that the American flag represented everyone. And in contrast, the pride flag was either a social movement or a political statement, which they could not support. In contrast, those speaking in favor of the ordinance often told deeply personal stories of the pain they or their loved ones had suffered as a result of being LGBTQ+. And a common thread was their fervent hope that others would not have to suffer as they have. As I listened to these starkly contrasting views, I realized that those speaking against the proposed ordinance denied the existence of a wilderness. 
or as those either from or in support of the LGBT community affirm the reality of this wilderness from painful personal experience. Hasn't this always been true? When Japanese Americans were deprived due process and forced into relocation camps, popular sentiment in this country was that this was necessary for national security during wartime. Some even went so far as to say that it was for the good of the Japanese American community to be removed from the West Coast, that they would be safer in the nation's interior. A byproduct of oppression is that often the oppressed remain silent out of fear of further reprisal. This was the case with many in the Japanese American community who were incarcerated, including my mother and others of her family. As I mentioned, I was born in 1946, and thus I had no direct experience of internment. However, my mother, my aunts and uncles, my grandparents and their friends, all of whom suffered, hardly ever spoke of their experience. And if they did, it was in hushed tones, with, often with a shrug, a sigh. And I learned the Japanese expression, shikata ganai, which roughly means it cannot be helped. My first realization that what happened to my family was wrong came not from them, nor from anyone else who had experienced this indignity, but instead from a white professor of anthropology at Michigan State University during my freshman year. After class, I had stopped to ask him a question, and seeing me, he asked if I was Japanese American. I said I was, and he expressed um, uh, disapproval of how unjust the internment had been. And this was a shock to me. I didn't know how to respond because I had always just accepted that this was the way things were. Shikata Ganai. In retrospect, I realized how naive and how sheltered I had been. And I feel a personal responsibility to do what I can to help other people who are marginalized because of who they are. I also feel that we all share this same responsibility, even if your family hasn't been impacted as dramatically as mine was. Remember, we are all called into the wilderness to prepare God the way for God's kingdom. Or in the words of our street banner sign, a just world for all. But we cannot fight injustice alone. We need others to stand with us when the going gets tough. And that's why I feel we need the church, our church, Fox Island United Church of Christ. It is here where we can tell our stories of being broken and of being brave. We can share our fears of the wilderness in whatever form it may appear. And when we are afraid, we can take courage from the words and actions of others. We can know that we are never alone. We are not alone. We can be beacons of hope for those lost in the wilderness. During the past year, I've been heartened by what our church has done in support of the LGBTQ community. When our street banner sign proclaiming a just world for all was vandalized twice in one week, we put it back up again. In November, we hosted the Transgender Day of Remembrance at our church and many of us participated in that solemn event, as well as the potluck dinner that followed. We have shown up at events important to the LGBTQ plus community, such as the Pride March and the aforementioned Geek Harbor City Council meeting, of which I am happy to say 
the resolution to fly the pride flag did pass. So on this second Sunday of Advent, when we have lit the candle of peace, let us continue to work on behalf of the LGBTQ plus community as well as all other people who have been marginalized. Let us live the words of welcome printed every week in our bulletin cover. Whoever you are, and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And let us remember that the call of Isaiah is a call to action, to step into the wilderness, to prepare the way of the Lord, to make straight in the desert a highway for our God. It is our sacred duty and it's our privilege to make sure that all God's children are on that road. Amen.